My name is Leah Bolger, and I am so thrilled to have you all here for this conference. And this conference is the first action, the first event that a relatively new coalition, which is a coalition against U.S. foreign military bases, has, has come together with uh, several um, charter organizations, 13 charter organizations, and we are joined in, in order to, to address the issue of U.S. foreign bases, which are um, everywhere. Uh, somewhere between 100, 800 and 1,000 in 172 countries. Ridiculous. So uh, this is what uh, the coalition is about, and this is the first event that we put on. So I am a co-coordinator with uh, Bauman Azad. The first person who is going to speak is uh, Reverend C.D. Witherspoon. He's a local uh, minister, and he has had a uh, death in the family, and so he's, I don't think he's going to make it. So, um, I'm sorry, uh, he was going to welcome you all, and so on behalf of Reverend, Reverend Witherspoon, I welcome you all to the conference. So, um, that brings us to uh, Mr. Al Martyr. Al is the president of the U.S. Peace Council and the vice president of the World Peace Council. He is also the honorary president of the International Association of Peace Messenger Cities and the NGO rep at the UN. He sits on several committees and commissions and has won numerous awards for his dedication to bringing peace to the world. Al? I had a stupid accident this afternoon, and that's why I'm in the wheelchair. Uh, Madam Chair, and honored guests, you, you here are winter patriots. Our country and the world are in crisis. And you are responding as patriots have throughout our history in the struggles for independence, against slavery, for equality, and for social justice. We have come together to oppose these policies that are threatening to bring the world to the precipice of war and destruction. You are the bulwark of the people's opposition to these policies. Yes, you. The billionaires have captured our government. The billionaires and their generals and the merchants of death who are profiting from a military budget that is 60% of the national treasure. 60% of the national treasure goes for killing. These billionaires are in the process of undoing all the social gains for which you and we have fought these many years. They are deliberately trying to divide us with policies and rhetoric, with racism, anti-immigrant, anti-foreign born, anti-women, anti-poor, hate in order to move their nefarious agenda forward. These imperialist policies, under administration after administration, since 1945, have led to a U.S. military presence in 172 countries. A few weeks ago, when four U.S. soldiers were killed in Nigeria, the New York Times printed an editorial and asked the question, what are we doing there? Billionaire President Truman, Trump also commented, what are we getting out of this? New York Times, President Trump, you know very well what we are getting out of this. Global domination. We have invaded the national sovereignty of country after country. 
installing our military presence, installing minor partners, so U.S. finance can, can exploit the national resources and dominate their sovereignty. We have sent 138,000 soldiers, our sons and daughters, stationed around the globe. In addition, U.S. naval power prepared to wage war is in waters surrounding the major targets. These military bases are polluters, hazards to the environment, threats to the safety of the populations, and destruction of their cultures. We have come here this weekend to share our analysis and our experiences. But more than that, we have come together in unity, in total agreement that our deep historic and patriotic responsibility is to mobilize our country, the people of our land, to oppose these policies that are driving the world towards war. Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> we have assumed a great responsibility. We cannot do it alone. We must bring together every force, every voice in opposition to these policies. And beyond our borders, in country after country, our brothers and sisters are struggling against these U.S. military bases. We must join with them in a global mobilization of people for peace. We here in the United States bear a special responsibility, and that is why we have come together. Together, together, united, we will prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Um, Al has been the driving force for the creation of the, the coalition, and uh, we, can't, we can't underestimate, I mean, we can't over, uh, overestimate how uh, valuable his work has been through the years. Our next speaker uh, is Ajamu Baraka. Ajamu has been a dedicated human rights activist for decades. He is the founding executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, the co-founder and president of Black Alliance for Peace, and he serves on the boards of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Africa Action, Latin American Caribbean Community Center, Diaspora Afrique, and the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. And I'm sure everybody knows that in 2016, he was the Green Party nominee for Vice President of the United States. Ajahn? I voted for you. Thank you, thank you. I greet you this evening by saying, as we always say when we open up here, all power to the people. All power to the people. This must be more than just, and it is, more than a slogan. This commitment to bringing power to the people has to be the defining mission of our work. Many of us have been involved in this this struggle, this attempt to build power for the masses of the oppressed people in this country and around the world for quite some time. We have been successful in, in fact, building a degree of power, but we know that we have before us a challenge, a challenge and a responsibility. And that's why we're here this evening. We understand that the little bit of progress we've been able to make in this country to expand the range of democracy coming out of the 
so-called civil rights struggle and the black liberation movements and anti-war movements of the 1960s and 1970s. We know that that progress, those spaces that we open up, were in many cases quickly reversed. So we know how tenuous progress can be. We know that because we are living the consequence of the counter-revolutionary process that emerged in the 1970s, we are living that reality today with the evolution of, of the um, corporate Democrats and neoliberalism and the ascendancy of Donald Trump. We are living this reality because we remember that 50 years ago, Dr. King said that there was something in the center of the American spirit, a malady, that was making the U.S. society a threat to the entire world. He also said 50 years ago that the U.S. was the greatest purveyor of violence on this planet. 50 years later, that still remains the reality. What that says, my friends, is that the struggle is constant, it ebbs and it flows, but it means that there has to be a core of us that always believe in and are committed to struggling for real power to the people. That when we talk about power to the people, we talk about building democracy. We're talking about what it takes for us to be able to realize that power. And for us, that means the fundamental transformation of this society. It means that we have to put back on the agenda, back in the center of our program, the objective, and that objective is basically for revolutionary change. We're not going to be able to get rid of the scourge of war until we understand that. We're not going to be able to live up to our responsibility to the people of the world until we understand that this rapacious, greedy, backward capitalist class has to be disempowered. That until we take away their ability to impose their will on the masses of people in this country around the world, we're never going to be able to eliminate the scourge of war because it is through war and violence and repression that they're able to maintain their dominance. So we are here this weekend and we're going to have a lot of information that we'll be exposed to. We're going to talk about the number of bases and talk about the military budget. We're going to talk about why it's important for us to organize ourselves and what might we do after this weekend. But my message this evening is for us to think about our responsibility to the world to understand that this challenge of building an anti-war movement is not a, a, a add-on to what we already are doing. And that's something that we just sort of incorporate lightly. My position and the position of the Black Alliance for Peace is that this anti-war movement, this movement against repression, this movement to address and confront directly imperialism is a fundamental responsibility we have to the world. Because it is this state operating in our name that's imposing untold misery on millions of people around this world. You know, they came up with a, a concept, the concept of of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect. 
the cover that they used in order to intervene and to undermine societies. But the question that has to be raised is, who protects the people from them? And the answer, my friends, is basically us. Alfred talked about the fact that we have certain special responsibilities, and we do. We are at the center of empire. That's why this coalition is so fundamentally important. The very fact that we can talk about the fact that the U.S. has bases around the world in 172 nations. That very fact itself demonstrates that this is in fact an empire. And that understanding has to be communicated to the American people. That being part of an empire being part of a system in which 1% of the population is able to impose its interests on all of the rest of us in this country and around the world, it means that we have a special responsibility, that we are strategically located to undermine that power when we understand our responsibility. So, we have to remind ourselves and to remind all of the people we work with of that special responsibility. We have to tell people in this country that you can't pretend that you believe in the sanctity of life, that you believe in human rights, that you believe that, all li that black lives matter, while at the same time you don't speak out when the lives of Palestinians are being threatened and taken. When you, have, when you have a humanitarian disaster in Yemen, where this state engages in a veritable rampage across Western Asia, or what we call the Middle East, where ancient cities are destroyed, millions of people murdered, and millions of people displaced. All lives, in fact, do matter. And our responsibility is to make sure that that principle is translated into policy, into political stances. And the only way that we're able to do that is when we name the enemy and are committed to struggling against that enemy. So we have to say very clearly who the enemy is. And for us in the Black Alliance for Peace, we're clear. We understand that there is a permanent war agenda because that is the only way in which this minority can maintain its dominance. So we understand that in order for us to advance the interests of the black community and the oppressed community is for us to recognize that we are fundamentally connected to all the people of the world, to all of the oppressed people of the world. We recognize that what we have when we have war and conflict is in fact a class battle. We recognize that we have to name the terms of this battle and the enemy, and that enemy is this rapacious, white supremacist, colonial, capitalist patriarchy. We name that enemy because we have to be very clear, and we have to be very clear in our engagements with the people. We have to name that enemy because we don't have the luxury not to do that. We don't have the luxury because the people who are in the crosshairs of U.S. imperialism don't have the luxury. So we say that we have to confront ourselves, that the era of the politics of respectability, of pragmatism, of glossing over these contradictions is over because the enemy itself 
they understand that the only way that they're going to be able to maintain their dominance is through more force and more violence and more repression. Their answer to the legitimation crisis that they face is force, violence, and repression. So all of the, the nice ways in which the uh, 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 relations of power was, was, was camouflaged using the tools of, of ideology, now because of this legitimation crisis, it boils down now to the naked use of power. So we have to be clear. We have to be clear about that. That as we go forward, that this crisis they face in terms of legitimacy, which is connected to the crisis they face in terms of the dysfunctionality of this system, that it's only going to get worse. Therefore, we have to be clear and the people have to be clear what it is we're up against and we have to be clear about what it is we need to fight for. So we say very clearly that we are opposed to this enemy that is the enemy of humankind. And we're also clear that the only way that we're going to be able to advance our collective interests is when we recognize that war is an instrument of class rule and that we have to, in fact, overthrow this enemy and build a new society on a new basis. And we have to be very clear about that and say very openly that the only way we can do that is when we eliminate capitalism and commit ourselves to a new kind of economic, political, and social system organized on the basis of the needs of the people. And that system has to be, and it is called socialism. So my friends, we have a task before us this weekend. We have to struggle among ourselves to build a baseline for unity because we know that all of us may not be there in terms of, of being prepared to take a clear uh, class line. We may not have full agreement on what it means for uh, national oppression and national liberation. Uh, we may not be in agreement in terms of the character of this state. But we can agree that any time you have this state involved in direct intervention, any time you have this state that is involved in attacking another state and another people and another nation, that that is a crime that all of us can be united in opposing. Right. That commitment to peace can be the baseline. And what that means is that no matter what may be happening internally to a particular country in a particular state, we have to have a commitment to the principle that that is their business. We may have uh, opinions about what is happening in that state. We can take positions on that individually and through our organizations. But we should be committed to the, to the, the principle that no matter what may be happening, no matter what are the contradictions in that nation state, any time that there is uh, intervention by outside forces and the U.S. particularly, we should be opposed to that. That's the baseline that we should have. So my friends, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have to use this campaign as an entry point to talk about uh, empire, to talk about our responsibility, to uh, impress upon the people the fact that the most effective expression of internationalism is to, in fact, be anti-war. That we live on a, this planet 
collectively, and that we cannot be concerned about social justice in the U.S. and be silent about the sufferings of our fellow human beings around the world. We must understand that in this anti-war movement that we build, that that movement isn't just focused externally, that the opposition to war and to violence and repression has to be connected to our understanding of the repressive character, the war and the violence that's carried out right here within our borders. That right here within the borders of this territory we call the United States of America, in these black and brown colonized spaces, we face an eternal enemy that's waging a war internally. This domestic military that we call the police, their job is to control and to contain us. And so our responsibility is to make those connections, to see the common interests, to recognize again that we cannot be focused just on the U.S. or just on outside of the country. That we have to have an awareness, a consciousness in which all of these connections are made in terms of the common enemy and our common interests and to connect up these struggles. That's the basis of real solidarity. That's what we strive for this weekend. That's what we must do and create with this coalition and with this campaign. Our responsibility is to, in fact, to do that, to find a way in which we can build unity, to understand that if we don't do that, we have failed ourselves, and we have failed the world. So let's join together this weekend, my friends. Find a way that we can, in fact, build this new movement. Remind ourselves of our potential power. And let's build this new movement, this coalition, this new anti-war motion here in this country. And let's make a reality the slogan of power to the people. Thank you. I am quite certain that I can say that everyone in this room, if not everyone in the rest of the world, believe that the world would be a better place if uh, Jammu and Jill had won the election. <laughs> All right. So our next speaker is Rabindra Adhikari. He is the member of the Secretariat World Peace Council and the national coordinator of the Nepal Peace and Solidarity Council. He serves as a member of the Foreign Relations Department of the Communist Party of Nepal and is the former General Secretary of Youth Federation Nepal. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, dear friends, this is the message of World Peace Council for the grand success of this conference against U.S. foreign military bases. To the organizers of the conference and the coalition against U.S. foreign military bases, dear friends, fellow fighters for a world peace and social justice. The World Peace Council, WPC, the historical international peace organization 
founded right after World War II, with the membership today in more than 90 countries, salutes the holding of your important conference against the U.S. foreign military bases. We have endorsed with pleasure your event and your unity statement, and several of your member organizations are attending this day's the conference. We convey our greetings to the participants of the conference, in particular the consequent peace-loving forces who are struggling in the USA for a world without imperialist domination, wars and aggressions, for a world where peoples and nations will live in a peace and prosperity as real masters of their wealth and of their fortunes. The subject of your conference, the U.S. foreign military bases, your clear opposition to them and your demand to close them down in novel is novel and shows your commitment to a just cause for which millions of people, peace-loving people struggle and strive worldwide. From the global point of view, foreign military bases are not only instrument of interference in the domestic affairs of the host countries, but are the principal starting points for military aggressions and permanent threats to peoples and countries. The foreign military bases serve as well for the purpose of suppression of popular protest and uprisings. There is no doubt that the main aggressors today in the imperialist dominated world is the USA, regardless who inhabited the White House. The USA is using NATO, the biggest war machine humanity has ever seen for its own goals since 1991. NATO has been expanding towards the east, trying to encircle its main competitors such as Russia and China with troops and missile seeds. While it uh, triggers and orchestrates violent regime changes or color revolutions, it is in uh, inverted comma, as it was the case in the Ukraine. It would not be the fair to the truth if we would not mention the role of the key allies of the US, particularly the United Kingdom, France, Germany, but also all countries which provide strategically important military bases to the US, such as Italy, Turkey, Greece, Gulf, Gulf monarchies, from whose territories many aggressions have been carried out against Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and others. Allow us on the occasion to reiterate and join our voices with the global peace movement representing hundreds of millions of people in the world in our demand to end the imperialist wars in the Middle East, the imperialist plans in Eastern Europe, but also the imperialist interference by the USA in Latin America and the rest of the world. As you correctly point out, in your unity statement, the implication and consequences of the hundreds of foreign mil US military bases and the huge military expenditure for maintaining them are likewise important for the American people. The US dollar 156 billion, the US annually spends those bases in conditions of growing poverty and extreme poverty in your own country, makes it only more catastrophic, especially when the profits of transnational cooperation and monopolies are at the same time growing, even in times of economic crisis of the system. Only a small 
fraction of this amount could solve all problems of hunger and malnutrition in the world. Last but not least, allow us to underline our firm position as WPC for the closure of the U.S. bases in Guantanamo, which is Cuban soil, <laughs> illegally used and illegally used and occupied by the U.S. against the will of the Cuban people and its sovereign government. The Guantanamo base further constitutes a clear violation of international law. The territory of Guantanamo has to be returned without condition to Cuba. Dear friends, the WPC supports your initiative and is ready to work with you all and with many peace movements in the world to enlarge and extend the scale of our actions by internationalizing our struggle in order to build a global movement for the evolution of all foreign military bases and the US bases in particular. The WPC is committed to this struggle and is ready to contribute its forces, its forces and principal position to such perspective. We wish you all success in your conference in Baltimore and are looking forward to meet you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm so excited that we have such wonderful speakers here from all over the world. And we know that the rest of the world wants peace. And it's really wonderful to see people um, and, and see that, in, 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 you know, close, to, close up, that we can talk to these people and hear, and hear their, their voices. So uh, my next uh, speaker is going to be Sarah Flounders, who will read the message of solidarity from the Cuban uh, Peace Council. Thank you, Leah. Cuba C. Blackeo, no. Uh, I really did want to take just a minute to read the message first to myself because it's such an important message and a real honor. Uh, this is a message from the Cuban Movement for Peace and the Sovereignty of the Peoples, which is MOVPAZ, that's a Spanish acronym, to the National Conference of the Coalition of the United States Organizations Against Foreign Military Bases. Dear friends, world peace is seriously threatened by the actions of imperialism and its NATO allies who insist on establishing a new geopolitical global order in favor of their illegitimate interests of domination. Humankind continues to watch astounded the military interventions carried out openly or slyly on several nations and the regrettable consequences of death, destruction, and poverty that they produce among the peoples. In addition, is a terrible phenomenon of terrorism that in a certain way plays their games and propitiates imperialist ambitions. Another equally tragic consequence has been the disorderly migration, thousands of people trying to escape from war and terrorist action. This has become an, a phenomenon of great magnitude that has caused the death of so many hundreds of people at sea and the neglect and slovenliness of many of the nations to which they manage to arrive. On the other hand, the, economic, the capitalist economic crisis threatens with recycling and reinstalling the neoliberal model that has endured retreats in many parts of the planet. The first rank role in the enforcement of that whole imperial strategy is played by the military bases and installations of the United States and its European allies in numerous countries from all continents with the approval of the submitted governments. These installations become outposts of aggression 
and interventions against many nations, as well as ignominious controllers of the will of independence and sovereignty of their peoples. There are numerous and regrettable examples of violations of the people's rights caused by the foreign military bases and installations, which have likewise been usurpers of the sovereignty and genuine independence of the nations they have been set up. The proclamation of Latin America and Caribbean as a peace zone approved by the heads of state and government of our region during the second summit of the community of Latin America and the Caribbean states, the acronym of that is CELAC, in Havana in January 2014 is in full effect today. It is necessary that all the peoples become aware that a peace zone is not just a zone without wars, but also a zone of economic progress and justice and social dignity and of independence and sovereignty. Under such circumstances, it is essential that all peace-loving peoples strengthen the unity of action and coordination to strongly denounce the presence and actions of foreign military bases and convoke the peoples to express themselves against the permanence of these aggressive installations. Therefore, the Cuban Movement for Peace and Sovereignty of the Peoples, MOVPAS, salutes and supports enthusiastically the healthy initiative of the United States Peace Council of promoting the creation of a coalition of United States organizations against the foreign military bases and the celebration of the National Conference today. Cuba has the sad merit of having part of its territory illegally occupied by the oldest naval base of the United States in the world against the sovereign will of its people. Hence, the sustained Cuban claim to the United States for the return of the illegally occupied territory of the Guantanamo naval base. And, right. It's an essential issue and a matter of principle for Cuba that has been recognized by the huge majority of the international community together with the claim for the lifting of the economic, financial, and commercial blockade of Cuba. In April 2017, the province of Guantanamo and its homogenous capital again was the venue of the fifth international seminar for peace and against foreign military bases. On that occasion, the seminar brought together more than 250 peace activists, a good many of them from the United States, who joined the just claim of the Cuban people. We hope to have your presence again in 2019, when we will be celebrating the sixth seminar of international peace and, foreign, and against foreign military bases, as well as your support and solidarity as peace friends from the United States. Comrades and friends, MOVPAV shares the purpose and objectives of the coalition that you seek to achieve with this national conference. We declare our readiness to subscribe and endorse the documents and results that emerge from such important meetings, given their relevance for our common struggle against the presence of foreign military bases in our region and worldwide. Cuba is grateful for the just selection of February 23rd, mark that date, February 23rd as International Day Against Military Bases. Since it was precisely on that historic day in 1903 that the first U.S. base outside its national territory was established. And that's Guantanamo. So keep in mind February 23rd. International Day Against Military Bases. We fervently wish you the greatest success in your deliberations and we express our conviction that the actions that will derive from the conference 
will be a landmark for world peace and consequently a new step of advancement in the people's global struggle against imperialism. Peace greetings, and this is signed from Silvio Platero, president of MOPAL. Thank you, Sarah, for that very powerful message. You know, we're here from many different peace and anti-war organizations, and we always lament the fact that where is the peace movement, where is the anti-war movement since Vietnam? It's just gone kind of quiet. But you know, even if we are much more robust, even if all of our organizations are united and robust and powerful, it will not be enough to dismantle the American military machine. We are going to have to work with people around the world to put pressure on this machine. And that's why this is so important to work in a global sense. So I would ask you, if you're watching this via live stream, that you go to the website noforeignbases.org and you read the unity statement. Now, those of you here, the copy of the unity statement is in the program. And if you haven't done so already, I urge you to go to the website and add your name to the people, a list of people who support this unity statement so that we can become a powerful movement, solid, united around the world. Our next uh, guest speaker, uh, unfortunately, uh, took ill. And uh, his name is Miguel Figueroa. And he was going to uh, read uh, a message of solidarity from the Canadian Peace Congress. So since he's not here, um, we still want you to hear the message. So I'm going to read it, please. Message of solidarity from the Canadian Peace Congress. Dear friends, fellow peace campaigners, on behalf of our executive and our acting president, Miguel Figueroa, I send you heartfelt greetings. The Canadian Peace Congress and its affiliates view the struggle against foreign military bases and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as a central component of the struggle for global peace and disarmament. Our organization advocates that Can Canada should leave NATO and the North American Aerospace <laughs> Defense Command. We also campaigned for Canada to cut its military budget, stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia, and say no to continuing pressure from the U.S. for Canada to join the U.S. ballistic missile defense system. We also demand that Canada stop its efforts to undermine the governments of Venezuela and Syria and others, and urge the Canadian government to adopt a foreign policy based on peace and disarmament. We wish the conference every success. Ed Lehman, executive member, Canadian Peace Conference. So thank you to our friends in Canada. Um, our next speaker is John Lannan. John Lennon is a founding member of Shannon Watch, whose primary focus is ending the mili U.S. military use of the civilian airport at Shannon, Ireland. He is a member of the national executive of PANA, Peace and Neutrality Alliance, and he works as a lecturer and researcher, researcher at the University of Limerick. Let's please welcome John Lennon. Thank you, Leah. Um, Friends, um, I'm honored to be speaking at this meeting, um, and I'm bringing messages of solidarity, support from the peace and the anti-war movement in Ireland. Um, so, uh, we, we, do, we do exist. Um, you know, we're, we're a small, supposedly neutral country. We're on the periphery of Europe. Um, I say supposedly because the Irish state that came into being about 100 years ago um, it was staunchly independent, it was neutral, it was anti-imperialist, and that's been systematically eroded over the last few decades. Um, we've been sucked into the military-industrial complex. Um, we support US imperialism now, wholeheartedly, or at least the elite of the country do. Um, the people don't. Um, our government claims now that we have a policy of military neutrality, which basically means nothing in international law, but um, there, there's no such thing as that. But even if there was, we're violating it. We're participating in, we're supporting military um, alliances. Um, on the European front, if, if I may use that phrase, um, we just signed up to a thing called PESCO, Permanent and Structured 
cooperation. It integrates the armies of 25 of the 28 EU countries. Um, it's a significant step towards an EU army. Um, I'm not going to talk about that now, but what I am going to talk about is that there's another clear breach of Irish neutrality, which is the fact that almost 3 million US troops and their weapons have passed through one of our small civilian airports, Shannon Airport, since 2002. The, the airport was made available to the US military for the invasions and the occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq. It was supposedly temporary, but 17 years later, we're still trying to get the US military out of Shannon Airport. Um, we've got contracted troop carriers coming through, operated by the likes of Omni Air International and Atlas Air. We've got US Air Force, Navy, Hercules, Jet, um, or aircraft, we've got mid-air refuelers, we've got all that stuff. We've also had CIA rendition planes coming through Shannon Airport. Numerous reports verifying that. Um, but we've had no investigation by our government about this. Um, they've been silenced by their imperialist masters. They, they, don't, they don't investigate. They, don't. they tell us, actually, that if we have any evidence to, to bring it to them. We've brought wheelbarrows full. We've brought stacks that high. They ignore it. Um, so one of the organizations that I represent, Shannon Watch, has systematically logged all the military and military contracted planes through Shannon. We have a lot of data. We've asked a lot of questions. And the other organization that I'm also representing, the Peace and Neutrality Alliance, have also asked a lot of questions. Um, a lot of members of our national parliament have asked questions. Um, but there's an official shroud of secrecy over all of this. Um, you know, we keep, uh, we keep resisting, we keep protesting. We, we've got to go on, we keep doing this, we must do that. All of us must do that, and we will, of course, won't we? Yeah. Yes, we will. <laughs> the, the aircraft that we have coming through Shannon, um, they, they're going to other, you know, some of them are coming back here um, to, to US bases here. Some of them are going to places like Kuwait, Kyrgyzstan. We've tracked planes to NATO bases in Crete, to Incirlik in Turkey. Um, and we've recorded a lot of traffic coming over and back to, to the, the bases in the UK, particularly Mildenhall was one that we, um, we've, we've seen a lot of traffic through. But, you know, we're neutral, we say. You know. Yeah, we're neutral on the side of the warmongers. Um, now, it's worth saying a few brief words about our neighbours over in the UK. Um, a while back, the UK independent paper used a lovely phrase. They said, Washington's overseas military and intelligence bolt hole of choice. That's what, that's what they are. Um, they've always, it's the, yeah, it said Washington's overseas military and intelligence bolt hole of choice. You know, they, they've been a staunch ally of um, US. There's a whole range of installations spread across that country. And they've legal frameworks like the Visiting Forces Act, you know, which talks about what foreign military personnel can and cannot do in the UK. And we, we don't have that in Ireland because officially there are no visiting foreign forces in Ireland, despite these three million troops and their weapons that have come through Shannon Airport. Um, of course, the US has had yeah, nuclear weapons located in the UK as well. Um, places like Feltwell and Lake and Heat. Um, and there's a couple of other really sinister places that are worth mentioning as well. I'm sure a lot of you know about them already. Men with Hill, communications, um, interception base, covertly monitoring satellite traffic, uh, routing data for the US missile defense system. Um, the RAF base at Croton also acts as a CIA communications hub, um, provides a data link to the drone base in Djibouti. Um, and then over in Ireland, like the, the, the UK, um, there's lots of Irish-based companies that have contracts with the, the United States Defense Department. You know, the research and development contracts. I work in a university myself, and I see it. I know it's happening there. Um, you know, the provision of freight services, the supply of forensic and medical equipment, and secure communications equipment. Um, and of course, we have a very high capacity transatlantic fiber optic cable as well with a relay center in Dublin in the capital. Um, and the extent to which this has been used to support US um, military operations abroad is, is unclear. Our government won't tell us. Um, so the corporatization of war is, is all around us in Ireland, just as it is in so many other parts of the world. Um, so just come back to Shannon as, as a US military base. It's providing 
air transport support, aerial refueling. It also provides support for lots of special service missions. And both our Peace and Neutrality Alliance and Shannon Watch have been campaigning to end this now for, for the last 17 years. And, and we're doing this because, well, first of all, it's at odds with our policy of um, neutrality. Um, and and the, the, the independent polls that have been conducted in Ireland consistently show that the Irish people support our neutrality and do not want the US military in, in Shannon Airport. So, so, so that gives us hope. We just want the government to lead as government should do and implement the will of the people. Um, of course, it also puts us at risk. Um, and as an evident member of the, what are they called, the coalitions of the willing, isn't it, and all those phrases that they, that they use, you know. Um, these are the coalitions that have, of course, invaded, they've occupied the Middle East, and um, you know, we're, we're complicit, we're, we're part of that in Ireland. Um, and, and this military use of Shannon Airport, it's of no economic benefit, we, we know this. Um, but of course, even if it was, um, you know, if there was a bit of financial gain for it, it's still not worth the suffering and the grief caused by war, the millions of people who have died, the millions of people who have been displaced from their homes, all of the suffering that it causes. Um, it's, it's just wrong. And perpetual war is no way to run a planet, is it? No. So, just before, to, to wrap up, um, I'm here to support this conference over the next couple of days, and I'm really happy to, to, to do that and to ask our friends in the No Basis Movement to help us get the US military out of Shannon Airport. Um, because in practical terms, this would make no real difference to, to, to US imperialism or to, to the war machine. Um, they could just use a different airport. You know, but, um, but you know, if, if one country says no, you know, and if we do get them out of Shannon, and if we do get them out of Ireland, then that sends a very clear message to the world, say that there is one country that will not tolerate you know, U US military presidents, one country that will say US military are not welcome on their soil. Um, and it would be one small step towards um, peace, towards justice, towards equality, and towards humanity again, I guess. So thank you all. Our next speaker will be Elsa Rosbach. Um, <laughs> Elsa is a German-American filmmaker, journalist, and peace activist. Since 2006, she has helped pioneer discussion of the strategic role of U.S. military bases in Germany. She has done extensive work against armed drones and serves on the coordinating committee of the campaign Stop Air Base Ramstein. Elsa? Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, she introduced, I should say that in addition to uh, uh, being on the um, uh, Stop Air, Air Base Ramstein, I'm also a member of two organizations that don't yet support Stop Air Base Ramstein, although many of their members do. I'm on the National Council of Attack and also the speaker on drones for the War Resisters International in Germany, which is the largest and oldest peace organization in Germany. So we're trying to build more support for Stop Rammstein and make the conditions for that possible uh, in the discussions in Germany. So I, therefore, I have two buttons here. Here is my Stop Rammstein from our big demo, our third big demo, which was our demo in Action Week, which was in September with over 5,000 very positive reports from Stars and Stripes. Uh, and uh, letting you know, we already have the other one in the works, the next one, that's the end of June uh, for the 2018. We hope many of you will come, or maybe you'll do solidarity actions, maybe you'll make your spring event then, uh, different suggestions. Um, and uh, on this one is uh, Lebenslaute, nice pink button. And Lebenslaute is a, a, a musicians activist group, classical musicians. And they uh, work also, uh, some of them like the Rammstein campaign, but they work closely with the War Resisters International that doesn't like Rammstein campaign yet enough. And, uh, and they uh, do wonder, did a wonderful blockade of AFRICOM, uh, which I was uh, lucky to participate in. And that was, that's the US Africa Command in Stuttgart. And that was a, uh, uh, they actually blockaded four, all four gates for over four hours. And the way they do it is going at 5.30 in the morning, 
uh, Af uh, and uh, and uh, putting up their instruments and sitting there and playing cellos and flutes and so forth. Not too easy for a German policeman to pound on someone who is playing Mozart on a cello. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, and uh, and I was pleased also, I have a little film on it, which I sent to a few people, I'm still finishing the last touches, and they did another one in Jagel in northern Germany, um, which is a German base, also a NATO, NATO base, and this is where the German drone pilots are directing the German surveillance drones that are from Israel in Afghanistan and in Mali, and giving the targeting information, of course, to NATO and the U.S., and also the tornadoes, which are weaponized, which Germany has flying over Syria. So they do a monthly action. So they're a bit like the uh, Hancock thing. And they also, this time, blockaded 11 bases for three, uh, gates, I'm sorry, for three hours. Okay, so. And I wanted to say, since there are discussions about the macho and feminist, I th these guys, the Rammstein, they're kind of more on the macho side. You know, we're going to take on the U.S. military at its heart, Rammstein. And the other ones uh, are more, you know, uh, concert creative. Uh, they got the Creativity Award with Code Pink of a German, a very important German Peace Prize in 2014. Okay, so a lot of old ladies like me getting carried away from the gate while singing. Okay, so anyway, um, so I told you about my two buttons. Uh, just a little background. You, you think I came from Germany and uh, my father was from, I did, was there in the Vietnam War as a student for seven years and we did a lot of organizing in the big two bases in Berlin, uh, which uh, I guess Gorbachev got rid of. But at that time, uh, we, you know, there was a lot of uh, resistance and we did, had GI newspapers and that sort of, then I came back to Germany in the 90s for professional reasons and got again very involved in the peace movement, working with the German peace movement organizations after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, which Germany officially rejected but still supported with allowing the use of the bases. So um, I'm asking why are the bases in Germany so important? Uh, First of all, um, uh, well, first of all, I told you about these. Uh, I want to tell you about the different bases I just mentioned, where there were uh, things. Rammstein is the largest U.S. air base outside the U.S. and it's the logistical hub for all of the U.S. Uh, uh, warfare in the Middle East, in Africa, and of course the threats to Russia and so forth. Basically, the way it works is that all of the U.S. drone bases, they f feed their data to Creech. Creech has an underwater cable, or overland for a while, underwater to Rammstein, and then the data, whether it's coming from surveillance uh, to the drones at Creech in, in the U.S. or going, or the order to strike and kill someone, that all goes over this, uh, over this fiber optic cable to the Rammstein, goes up to a satellite, and then communicates with, uh, with uh, the drones, and the drones are near to where they're being used, for example, East Africa for Yemen, or for example, um, Afghanistan for Pakistan. So that's, uh, and, and it was the revolution, the revelations of, of uh, U.S. whistleblowers, Brandon Bryant and Edward Snowden, that made clear the role of, of, of uh, this base also for drone warfare, but we knew already for the Iraq war and the Af and, and the Afghanistan war, 80% of men and materiel were go, went through Ramstein. Okay, so uh, they could have stopped the Iraq war if they had closed Ramstein at that time. Okay, so Africom uh, plays a very different role because the U.S. Uh, the Pentagon has divided up the world into six regions of of, of command. Uh, and and, and it, that's integrated command. It's everything from what the CIA is doing. It's everything from USIAAD, supposed humanitarian interventions, uh, pay, uh, you know, con supporting one tribe against another, whatever they're doing, uh, plus uh, build all the illegal things they're doing. That all is headed by this command. We know CENTCOM, who, which does uh, Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and AFRICOM does Africa. That is to say, all the infrastructure that's build, building out in Africa, where it was reported recently in the Spiegel, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm, I'm not even near my end of my thing. Um, let's see. Uh, 
uh, so uh, I'm just saying, Ye I told you about Yale. I'm just saying everything is happening uh, there, and including there in now in 53 countries, U.S. presence of 54 countries in Africa. And uh, there's also a resistance against Yoicom, Oicom in Stuttgart, the European Military Command, and there's also tremendously important uh, uh, struggle at Buchel, where it has the only remaining uh, atomic weapons of the U.S., a German base where German pilots only on order of the U.S. president would fly these uh, atomic weapons. So why is uh, uh, Europe so important and Germany so important? The legal system has never agreed with the idea of the war on terror. They disagree with that still on the books in all the German government policies in their legal books and in the European Parliament. So that means, uh, and, and, and in Germany especially with the Nuremberg principles and so forth, the idea that you would just have a policy of assassination. And, um, and that means also they are against, on the books, extrajudicial killings with armed drones, inclu uh, including categorically, including in the German gov coalition government uh, uh, agreement and also the European Parliament of 2013, it will be in and probably in the one they're negotiating now, and also the European Parliament resolution of 2014, things are still going forward to try to turn that into legislation with teeth throughout Europe which would include prosecuting any third parties that are assistance to third parties, meaning the U.S., who are using these uh, European countries for their operations that are uh, considered illegal under European law. So that's why it's very important to us, as well as the U.S. military. We have a new movement that has come about in our drone. It's three minutes now, and you just said three. Okay, now I have three. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll make it about four, maybe. Um, so um, the, the thing is that um, we have a very new movement. There used to be, for a long time, uh, environmental things, uh, noise of the planes and all. There were uh, movements in, in around Rammstein. There was Ansbach, got kind of somewhat took off when they wanted to expand that. That's where the helicopters, similar to the Shenzhou, which was much larger. When you try to enlarge a base, you get protests. But basically, as David Bynes' book said, people kind of settled in with the bases in Germany on the whole, except when it came out that these illegal drone strikes and violating, and they are complicit, and Germans do not want to be involved and feel they're involved in war crimes again. So they, th that was one factor. The other factor is that they suddenly became aware of the fact that has been true since 1991 when you had German sovereignty and reunification that Germany has the legal right and indeed the responsibility to shut down the U.S. bases if they're doing illegal things. They have the right, yeah. they have the right to, to cancel the stationing of forces agreements. So with this new hope of achievement and this new knowledge, you got a big m movement and you get people coming from all over Germany. And why are they coming? Is it because the noise, the environment, I'm hurt? The cost? No. It's the prospect of black and brown people being killed all over the world from German soil. And that is there, and with the complicity of the German government. That's what has created this big new base movement. It's not about this, it's about that. Okay. So I wanted to say that another thing we have to realize is that this no base movement is not identical in its aims or in its demands to the NATO. And in, in, in here's an example. At the end, of when Germany was reunified, the U.S. Air Force com commissioned the RAND Corporation to do a study in 1990, 1991. They did a survey of Germans in East and West Germany. 87% of Germans said they wanted to be part of international alliances. Guys, we know we did bad things. We want to be part of the community. NATO, you take it. UN also, so forth. Okay, that's, on the other hand, they were asked, 57% of all Germans, East and West, wanted the U.S. troops to leave along with the Russian troops, including 84% in, 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 in the East part of Germany. So you have actually fun, uh, 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 potentially a larger base of support and so forth. Stop or else, can I have like two more minutes? Okay, I'm almost at three, okay. 
Uh, so now we also have, which we didn't have before, a national struggle, a national debate. It's being heard in the Bundestag. Brandon and Brian even spoke for five hours as a witness in the Bundestag. There, it's before the Bundestag to at least deal with the illegal activities, the drone things. It's not really before them now to close the base, you know, which the left would like and the peace movement would like. But it is before them to take in a huge, huge step. It's not, it's also, they actually voted against in Germany the end of June, we're very proud of this, to have drones that have weapons. They actually kicked this out and they're actually considering in this new thing, like even the Social Democrats, to say that Germany wants no weaponizable drones in the next government. We we'll see how far that goes. Okay. So there's a different there's a difference also because you could close the bases and still be in NATO, or you could with for example as Turkey did at the at the beginning of the Iraq War. They said you cannot use our bases in Turkey. They stayed in NATO. At the same time, you know you could withdraw from NATO and still allow the bases. How many non-NATO countries have US bases in them, you see? So it's a separate issue. It's related, but separate. And um, then I just wanted to say the key role of the US movement in bringing about the Rammstein campaign, whether it's the whistleblowers that told us the truth, whether it was Code Pink coming in 2013 and later, and going, if I could say, and talking to the parliamentarians. And you know what? They listen to us even more than to the Germans. They do not want to be like the US. When we, they want to feel also there's a hope here, there's resistance here. So we have, and we're not part of one of the fighting political parties. We're there saying, hey, we're US citizens, probably members of the Democratic Party, and we're coming, if we're not in the Green. Uh, so, and we have a nice Green Party in our parliament too. And so we're coming and saying, we're, we need you to help us, Germany. We need you to help us, Europe. So this brings me now to the very last two minutes, and it's really a proposal that you guys need to have. Okay, I'm sorry, it's complex material. I like to talk, but it's complex material too. And this is that the next big stage is going to be Italy, because we have the base in Siganella. I don't know if you know that the, the, the Italian government allowed the U.S. to actually fly armed drones from Siganella to Libya last year. That means that they are now the first European country allowing U.S. drones to fly from there. Plus, the U.S. is giving them the weapons for their Reaper Bill of drones. That makes it the second country in Europe after Great uh, UK to have weaponized uh, drones, okay? And, we're tr and Germany wants to push back, many do, and say, well, Europe, we have to have a different, we have to have a, a, a defense thing without weaponized drones, and certainly without illegal strikes by weaponized drones. So um, my suggestion is, and, and I, the, to get beyond having, I've been in different no basis things and so forth, even since, uh, but we get the listserv, we have the conferences. I'm suggesting a project. This project is to really address Italy and to address the situation in Africa, particularly after what Trump said, to address yeah. and to bring together these three things, AFRICOM and the Rammstein, where you get two branches of the German peace movement involved in doing, you know, and the Italian movement, which is just starting up. And we have a German NGO where their status is a German NGO who is doing also the uh, Faisal Ali Ben Yabar case and so forth, they are helping the Italians to do a court case to provide transparency at what the hell the Italian government has given the US, okay? And I was at a conference in Milan and uh, in September, and they had the head of the Italian Air Force and someone from the Italian Defense Committee and the Italian defense committee said, we don't even know what they did. They don't have as much power as the German parliament within their whole government. It's more top down. But he said, we would really like, the, and I said, you know, we Americans have been going to the German parliament for years. What would you think about having some Americans come to the Italian parliament and talk about all of this? So I'm suggesting a project very active involving trips uh, you know, I think UK is also very important, but we have great people like Chris Cole dealing with. And you know what? The German and US peace movements are much more in contact with each other right now over these drones, over the bases, than the German and Italian movements are. Sorry, guys, we do not have a no basis network active in Europe, across Europe. We are not that much in communication. 
The U.S. could help make this happen. Bring the witnesses to the Italian parliament and bring this all together and push in Germany. We want action on Ramstein, and we want you not to really take the lead in not agreeing to weaponized or weaponizable drones. I, I hate to interrupt Elsa when she's on a roll because she's got a lot of important information. No, no, it's okay, but I just wanted to let everybody know that we are going to have a special plenary on Europe and NATO, and everybody will have an opportunity to, to, uh, to ask Elsa questions or, or, or speak about this same issue. So there will be another opportunity to, to hear from Elsa. I wanted to let you know, um, I, a lot of you know uh, that I was in the military for 20 years, and in 1996, I was stationed in Tunisia. And at that time, uh, our parent command was UCOM, European Command. They had all of Africa and all of Europe. And AFRICOM had not been formed yet. So in that short period of time now, Africa has become a big, important area that the United States wants to control in addition to the rest of the world. So they are building bases all over Africa now, and there is a separate uh, uh, command called AFRICOM. So there's a very significant indicator of our tentacles going farther and farther out. All right, um, our next speaker is Anne Wright. And, and, and everybody knows Anne. Anne served for 29 years in the US Army and retired as a colonel, and then served as a US diplomat for 16 years, working at embassies in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia, Afghanistan, and Mongolia. She resigned for the, from the U.S. government in March 2003 in opposition to the war on Iraq. She has done extensive work on behalf of Palestinians by organizing several freedom, fo fo freedom flotillas which attempted to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza. Nice. Anne lives out of a suitcase about 50 weeks out of the year. <laughs> and well, she works for peace and justice all over the world. And I am so proud to call Anne my friend and mentor. much to all of you all who have organized this great, great conference. Isn't it super to get us all together on yeah. stopping military bases? And I want to bring to your attention what we have on the back of, of the uh, brochure. Uh, all of the information about the numbers of military bases that we have around the world. And I know uh, tomorrow David Vines, who wrote the great book Base Nation, will be speaking here. And he'll give, a, among other things, a, a real overview of all of the types of uh, military bases that we have. Okay, what I'm going to talk about, I mean, we've, we've heard from people from all over the world, and at the, toward the end of mine, we're going to hear from another person straight from uh, uh, Asia. Uh, what I wanted to talk about, though, uh, to complement what has been spoken about so far is, okay, we know about all these bases, what can we do about them? What can we do about them? What are we doing about them? And in fact, if you uh, if you think about all of these places, uh, Korea, Okinawa, the mainland of Japan, Germany, Italy, the Middle East, where else am I forgetting that we have military bases? South America, South America where else? Africa. Africa, yeah. All of these places, where are we, are we active in these places? Actually, the ones that I put on here, where, where do we have activism going on right now? Where do you know that there are citizen activists that are challenging these military bases? Okinawa, Okinawa there we go. How about Korea? Yeah, yeah, Germany. We've just heard from Elsa on Germany. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of activism going on, and how, how can we be a part of all of this? Well, I wanted to start, and I don't mean to take the thunder out of the great panel that's going to be going on tomorrow. But I've been doing a lot of work in, in Korea and thinking about it, and I, I wanted just to kind of highlight things that are going on that you can participate in. You can go to these places. You can help the citizen activists of these countries. In, in Jeju Island, South Korea, for 10 years they were challenging a naval base being built there. Uh, how many of you all have been to Jeju Island? I know there's been a lot because there, stand up if you've been to Jeju Island and wave your hand. 
Yeah, so we've got five people, five, five or six people that have been to Jeju Island in solidarity with people that have been citizens that have been challenging the building of a naval base on a pristine area of, of uh, this island of peace. They have daily protests there that if you go in solidarity with them, you can do the, the one, 100 morning bows with them. You can go to a mass uh, uh, that the Catholic Church, I mean, talk about groups that help out to, to challenge these. The Catholic Church now has a mass or has had a mass every day at noon for like the fa past eight years, every day at noon in solidarity with the people there and a human chain of dancing for everyone. What are they protesting now? The, the naval base was built, unfortunately, despite all of this protest, despite all of it. But it was built on, I mean, everybody in Japan, um, pardon me, everybody in, in Korea knew about this base and they knew about the, the challenge the local people. Right now, the U.S. naval fleet is going in there. Uh, uh, here we have a U.S. nuclear submarine that has just gone in. And here are some of the activists that are challenging that submarine. And they challenge them by going out in kayaks, too, right in front of the ships that are coming in. And they have their protests every, every day, whether it's raining, shining, or sleeting. And here they are out in, the, out in the snow and the ice. And here on the right side are, are, is the human chain every day when they say, no more bases, no more bases in our place. And another place, and I know that some, Ellen served in, in uh, Korea, and uh, the, right, there, right there, in fact, yeah, at Camp Humphreys. Camp Humphreys, which now has been expanded, so it's, they say now it's the largest U.S. military base outside the United States. 3,500 acres it has, and will have up to 45,000 U.S. military, their families, civilian contractors, and Korean nationals. It's the largest U.S. military's peacetime construction project in South Korea. And who's paying for it? Well, we're not paying nearly as much as the South Koreans, and that's what's making them mad. They are having to pay 93%. See, that's what the U.S. government does. The U.S. government says, you need us there to protect you, and you're going to pay for it. Now, that sounds, that sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. This sounds like Trump. Well, Trump's ideas were going on long before Trump uh, had any political ideas. This has been a, a part of the U.S. government policies uh, for decades. Uh, and wherever there's a U.S. military base, there's usually a peace center somewhere around it that is the center or the focal point for citizen involvement there. What else is going on in South Korea? The THAAD missiles that were brought in under the which administration? Obama administration. Yeah, and uh, Medea and Will stand up again. They were a part of an international delegation that went to be a part of the THAAD protests. Yeah, there they are. Citizen activism here in the United States where we go in solidarity to help the people there, particularly when it's our stupid military bases that are a part of this thing. It's our, our responsibility to be there in solidarity. And I mean, if you haven't seen a South Korean activist in action, and when you get hundreds of them and thousands of them, I mean, they are fierce. They are fierce. Their little grandmothers are tougher than any U.S. Marine I have ever seen. Those grandmothers, they can go after them. And here's some more of them. I mean, tens of thousands of people are out on the street. It's not that they're taking this stuff lying down. They're saying, no, we don't want it. And that's where we come in. We have to say, no, we don't want our stuff going into other people's lands. Another group that we've been working with, Women Cross the DMZ. In fact, Medea and I and Jody Evans and several others from the U.S. were a part of a 15, 30 women delegation from 15 countries that in 2015 went to... North Korea, North Korea, as a part of a delegation. Two Nobel Peace Laureates were a part of it, Gloria Steinem, the great writer and activist. And we were there to meet with 250 women from North Korea on a, on a discussion about peace. And a march, a march with 5,000 women of North Korea who said, we want peace. And then we went across the DMZ and then went into uh, South Korea. And this is in uh, North Korea. This, and we, we uh, had a peace symposium in the Seoul City Hall, 
with another 250 women from South Korea who want peace. They want peace. So the citizen activism continues on through a Korea Peace Network that we now have of organizations that actually do work in North Korea. Whoever knew that, that we have US organizations that are working in North Korea? Supposedly there are sanctions on everybody, nothing happens, but that's not true. The Quakers have had a 35 year agricultural program in North Korea that still goes on. The Mennonites have had an agricultural program in North Korea. And until uh, the, Obama, the later part of the Obama administration, these two organizations were able to bring people from North Korea to the United States to learn about agriculture. But now that's all been cut off. The, Nor the Korea Peace Network also has sponsored several symposium about North Korea. And this is uh, uh, former Secretary of Defense William Perry that spoke at our last symposium where he said the North Koreans aren't crazy. They're not crazy at all. They're just trying to defend their regime. And we may not like their regime, but why should we overthrow it? Oh, except that it's a national policy of the United States to overthrow anybody we don't like. But the North Koreans, that's why they developed the nuclear weapon to say, you try it on us. We're not going to be like Saddam Hussein. We've got something that you'd better watch out for. So that's what they've done. Now, I, I'm... I'm going to be leaving here tomorrow morning early, and I'm sorry I can't be here for the rest of the, the symposium. I had planned on it until uh, we have the opportunity to be in Vancouver, British Columbia over the weekend and Monday and Tuesday. And we're going there because the foreign ministers of 15 countries of the UN Command Korea are going to be meeting in Vancouver. So we now have a delegation of 15 women that are going to be there to, on behalf of civil society to say, we want peace. We want peace. <laughs> and as, as a part of this, uh, on uh, next Monday night, we'll be having a candlelight vigil for peace in front of the Vancouver Convention Center where all the foreign ministers are going to be having their little cocktails and we're going to be right outside the plate glass window saying peace. And then the next morning, we're going to be meeting them as they go into the convention center to say we have peace. We also have a round table that the Canadian government is sponsoring for us. It's very interesting. Eight of the 15 foreign ministers that are going to be at that conference are women. Eight of them are women. And we're using this whole idea of a feminist foreign policy yeah. to, to try to get... Well, we're going to try to get into the meetings. Now, I, I kind of suspect we won't make it in, but we're going to get as close to the door. And then the Canadian government is sponsoring this roundtable that, that uh, members, some of the foreign ministers, are going to be attending. So we are very thrilled to be a part of this and to be able to be pushing, pushing hard for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Well, and as peace people, we need to know that the other things that are going on that we can capitalize on, with the Winter Olympics being held in South Korea, the South Korean peace community has decided they will have a peace conference in uh, the area, in Pyeongchang. So that is something to watch out for, the peace conference there. How do you help? What can you do? Particularly about this, now, you know, the issue of our time right now is let's not have a... a war over North Korea. Let's not do that. So what can we do? Right now, the Friends, uh, Friends Committee on National Legislation, FCNL, has taken up North Korea as their project, or the crisis on the peninsula. So if you are a part of the uh, FCNL community or want to be a part of it, you can help advocate for there. You can support the Quakers and the Mennonites in their agricultural programs. You can participate in trips. Veterans for Peace has had trips all over the place to Korea, to, to uh, Okinawa, uh, to Guantanamo. Catholic workers have been to uh, South Korea. Uh, you can participate in the vi vigils that we have in every city we're calling on. We can join with South Korean activists on Jeju Island and uh, on Sanju for the THAAD missile deployments. And just in the na next uh, six months, if you want to focus particularly on Korea, you can go to the peace conference that's going to be held at the end of January. Uh, you can go to Jeju Island because the warships, U.S. warships and submarines are coming in there. In uh, July, there will be a Peace at the Sea camp that's going to be held on Jeju Island. Then there's the, 
the Jeju Grand Li March for Life and Peace at the end of July, which Will was on last year, at, and I think you about died on it, didn't it? It was, what I mean, these, these people are tough. They walk totally around Jeju Island. And how hot was it, Will? Too hot. Too hot. <laughs> it was too hot. And then there's going to be a Northeast Asia Regional uh, Peace Building Institute. Two weeks of peace uh, discussions on Jeju Island. So here are lots of things you can do. Do community organizing, get some funds, and let's go do this. Yeah, okay, I, I just came from Hawaii. That's where my residence is. And on behalf of the people of uh, uh, our peace community there, I've been asked to deliver a message. This week is the 124th, 25th anniversary, tragic anniversary of the overthrow of yet one more country by the United States of America. And that was the kingdom of Hawaii. So as we remember all of these places around the world that the United States has overthrown, and if you look at the Pacific areas of uh, not only Hawaii, but also of Guam, a territory of the United States, you look in the Caribbean, the territory of Puerto Rico, and you look at places where the United States has focused a lot of its military bases. It's in these island territories and a state that was overthrown. We, we will be posting an appeal for you all to help us challenge a major military exercise that'll be going on off the waters of Hawaii. It's called Rim of the Pacific. And every two years they, ha they bring in uh, 45 surface ships from 26 nations, five submarines, 200 aircraft, 25,000 personnel will be in and around the Hawaiian waters. So we're appealing for everyone to remember this and we'll be putting out some information if you wanna help us in Hawaii challenge this. When you go home, because the point of this conference is not us just sitting here looking at this stuff, it's to go home and it's to have uh, meetings in your own community. Talk about what's going on, what the U.S. military is doing everywhere. Now, I know that there are some, who's here from Okinawa, who's part of uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, freedom, freedom for Hiroshi? Everybody, everybody that's part of this one, one lady right over here, who else? Yes, please stand up so everybody will know because they have a campaign to make sure he does not go to prison. So we need to support that. Right over here, here. Stand up. Stand up. Thank you. Yes. So please talk to these ladies, be in solidarity with them and whatever we can do to make sure that these tremendous activists of Okinawa are not all by themselves, that we are in solidarity with them as we are in solidarity with the people in South Korea, with the people in Germany, with the people in Italy, and all over the world where these, these citizens are saying, we don't want your military bases anymore. So thank you all very much and stop the bases. Watching the uh, film made me cry. Yeah. Anyway. I live in, we live in uh, U.S. and um, we started Okinawa Peace Appeal on the Facebook page, Okinawa Peace Appeal in English page. And then this time we start uh, uh, Justice for Hiroji campaign. Yay. He will be, um, verdict, it's going to be done March 14th. 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 So um, we are sending, we created this postcard and uh, send a card to judge, to pressure. All, all, all over the world is watching yes. for, for the verdict. So we have this, um, the postcard left on the um, uh, uh, BFB table. So if you could pick this up, it's already um, ready to go. The only thing is, is that you can put your comments here and also put the, uh, the postcard and then drop into the uh, post office, it goes to judge in Okinawa. Great. So, hmm? oh, so postage is dollar fifteen <laughs> for Even <laughs> international. Even after they raise the uh, in the postal rate, uh, January uh, yes, we have a, uh, the post office also. Uh, international is remains safe, so dollar fifteen. And uh, we are collecting only dollar, you know, 50 we are going to carry. And so just give us one dollar and then you drop off in a you know, small basket over there. And then we're going to mail. So um, the Facebook of uh, the page is the uh, Okinawa Peace Appeal in English.
It's all the uh, English articles on uh, something to do with Okinawa is posted. So please visit that, the page. Justice for Hiroji is the uh, yeah, this, Justice this is for Hiroji campaign. also we campaign. Have we have the page. Facebook page also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our third um, artist to perform this evening uh, is a very powerful messenger, I will say. And I have lost his. His intro, his bio, oh, excuse me, this is, oh, here we go, sorry, sorry. Our next performer is Son of None. Son of None doesn't just entertain, he empowers. His lyrics are rooted in the movements he's fought with. He's at the meeting, the protest, the action, and the mic. S.O.N. has rocked shows with Dead Prez, Immortal Technique, The Coup, Tom Morello, and Rage Against the Machine. He shared the stage with activists like exonerated former death row inmates Shuja Graham and Darby Tillis, Black Lives Matter student leader Michaela Gilliam, Gilliam Price, and the late great historian Howard Zinn. Son of None has released two albums, Blood and Fire, produced with DJ Crimson and The Art of Struggle with DJ Mentos. Please give a warm welcome to Son of None. How's everybody doing tonight? U.S. imperialism a little bit, right? It's personal, it's local, it's international. On the personal level, when the resources that should be going to your community are going to the military, you get bare bones social services, right? You get schools without heat, right? In addition to that, you get a stigma when it comes to mental illness, right? That's not necessarily to blame with US imperialism, but it's something that we deal with in this society and it's made worse by inequality, by unequal access to jobs, to healthcare, to things like that, right? It's PTSD for soldiers coming home, right? It's PTSD for the people in the lands that those soldiers have been to, right? Real quick by a show of hands, how many people have been touched by suicide? can look around the room and see you're not alone. How about depression? Right? So this piece is talking about my own experience with that in the context of inequality and imperialism. All right? This is the loaded gun talking to your only son, telling him his only choice is on the temple or the tongue. If you've been there, then you know I've only just begun unraveling the spiral where the spirit of survival's hung. Numb and expressionless underneath the precipice of all life has to offer, but the fall is far from effortless. Hope is a weapon if abandoned and rejected it comes with an urn to settle debts that it collects in it. Counting your breath, you spend what's left of life expecting it, reaching out for death until you find yourself reflecting it. This is the razor working through your maze of flesh and veins. A makeshift safety valve for mouths congested by the pain. Some speak of perseverance, but they never felt the strain. While others turn Columbus back and stay away from new terrain. These are the words you tell yourself that no one else believes. Because you think that you can see what no one else perceives. A soul is broken open, choking on a dream deferred. A light that's stifled by rejection of what's seen and heard. A hatred of the self deeper than anyone else. Just a feature of a creature that feeds on itself. Tiny cups with little pills and giant bills attached. Overdosing on the debt with no relief dispatched. I know the perils are staring into the barrel and I lost too many friends to this to want to trade apparel that pain making me numb and the numbness making me feral made me think wearing the coffin could make all this bullshit sterile no more burdening my people with this drama they'll all be better off if i can simplify this trauma 
I couldn't trust my mind, so I had to lose it. Almost didn't make it, ain't have a choice to do it. I've been to hell and back, I got the scars to prove it. You can't just walk around it, you gotta battle through it. It's hard to juggle this struggle and keep your head high. Why you think so many motherfuckers get high? Get blunted and get drunk to get by. We're getting wet up by the setup in this pigsty. They don't question diabetes like they question depression, but happiness is not a natural response to oppression. Soldiers eating their weapons after tours and deception, traumatized as brutalizers of fighters and their dependents. Huh? How about survivors and strivers for independence in the face of white power since the dawn of its ascendance? Passing down the struggle like a birthright to descendants when justice is executed because they tried the wrong defendants. But y'all don't hear me though, beyond the politics, beyond that everyday drama for what the dollar gets. It's the biology behind psychology that helps determine the way you see your reality. Messed up. In addition to fighting these, these military bases, on the personal level, there's a lot of talk about self-care right now, which I think is really beautiful. It's also very true that a lot of people don't have the resources to implement things like self-care. They don't have the time to take off of work and things like that. They can't get a mental health day, right? So community care is what we need to do to support each other, right? To lighten that low, because no one person should have to bear all that weight on their shoulders, right? So that's that. I said that it's local, it's personal, it's international. On the local level, what U.S. imperialism looks like in Baltimore is militarized police, right? Federal grants from the government giving out surplus military hardware to local police departments. It's ridiculous, right? Also, maybe your local major employer is a weapons contractor, or maybe it's a university that does research that benefits the military, right? Hopkins is that place in Baltimore, all right? So this next piece is about, um, is about that. It also talks about political prisoners, right? Because we need to lift up their voices as well, right? Free Mumia, this is for George Jackson, right? There's so many people. It's also standing up to police brutality. And real quick, I got this brother Tyrone West on my back. He was killed for doing nothing other than being black and driving a nice car, right? Since that happened, his sister, Tawanda Jones, has fought tirelessly, holding a West Wednesday rally this July will be four years. Every single Wednesday, rain, sleet, snow, hail, whatever, demanding police accountability, right? That's what that resistance looks like right here. It's also Tubman House, where they took over a vacant house and turned it into a community space, a garden where they're teaching kids how to, how to farm, right? Learning different things, basically saying, we don't have to ask for permission to do the things we need to do for our community. All right. So I'm going to say something and y'all say we bout that life. You can just read the shirt. All right, let's practice. You can find us in the street. Okay. All right. Usually I have to do it a few times, but y'all got it. I guess everybody's tired. All right. So here we go. We bled in Germany and Vietnam and Iraq. Came home to burning churches and got shot in the back. Huh. Shit, Bob shot the sheriff for less. He knew exactly who to give to in the chest. If you heard rap now, he'd be fucking depressed. With cats are yapping about, I am not impressed. 
But that's another matter for another rhyme I could deal with coward ass rappers at another time This rap for rebels, music for killing the devil In the name of freedom fighters, I rebuke you with metal It's for all them crackers with the apartheid patches Candidates who think race ain't important, it's taxes It's for nine lives, worth more than that rebel rag And all the massacres under American flags It's to honor the fallen veterans of the struggle The vanguard squad always ready to rumble And you can find us in the street we love that toe to toe with the police. We love that fight. Defended mine and yours. We love that fight. Since we got to these shores. We love that fight. Yo, stand up. Jam the man up, complete the plan to dip and clam up. Rise like Bree, man, tub man up. Turn some new keys and free the land up. Hands up. Like you're black on the block, stop by the cops, open these cameras to watch. Hands up like Afro's down with Castro, telling Nixon to lick they asshole. Hands up like you're hungry as fuck, praying nobody tries to press they luck. Yeah, black lives matter, man, but so does the rent. And what's left from buying medicine ain't making a dent. They close down schools like your brain in a stroke. Then they open up a jail like they cut in your throat. Huh. They take black life in every way. They just use the gun about once a day. And you can find us in the streets. Toe to toe with the police. Defending mine and yours. Since we got to these shows, finished the bid with the tool in his wig. He was schooling CEOs and had them doing the jig. Who's that? George Jackson Black, ready for action. Ain't a prison yet that could tame the black dragon. Ain't too many rebels that's approaching his levels. He found the keys to liberation in the belly of devils. Hell, one of the sharpest dark skin Marxists, one of the system's hardest targets. He was a BGFOG, incarcerated arm of the BPP, left coast. Soledad to San Quentin, nah, some man post for organizing resistance. I know you heard about his younger brother. They take the shoddy round the neck of the judge and burn rubber. I wish they made it like Asada did. He was a revolutionary with no fear of the power grid. Peace to butterfly for the caption. My heroes died in prison. George Jackson, find us in the streets. Toe to toe with the police. Defending mine and yours. Since we got to these shows, we brought that fight. We bout that what? We brought that fight. Said we bout that what? We brought that fight. Tyrone West, we brought that fight. Freddie Gray, we brought that fight. Close the bases, we brought that fight. We bout that life, we brought that fight. Damn right, we gotta keep saying that <laughs> and keep living it. Do I have time for one more? Should I? All, right. All right. How many people stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine? Yes. That's what's up. Used to be a time when not too many hands would go up and people would stop being friends with each other after the show. All right. This one is called Free Palestine. And I don't think I have to explain to anybody here the role that Israel plays in the Middle East when it comes to U.S. interests, all right? So support BDS, yes. free Palestine, yes. all right, here we go. I was born under an apparatus that downgraded my class status from citizen to subhuman savage. Hard to fathom, but even harder to manage. I'm a second class citizen in the land of my origin. Forced to forage in a brutal reality that's devoid of humanity for some semblance of sanity where truth is profanity and in all actuality, my right to life is considered the travesty. We can't even bury friends without the threat of the military showing up to carry out their very Vendetta, a policy of extermination against an indigenous population that's been fighting for emancipation. Want to end the violence and the occupation. 
want to see defiance then deny us liberation this is apartheid palestine what sniper fire gets showered from israeli watchtowers huh this is for haifa this is for rafa this is for gaza this is for balata this is for tarek this is for basher this is for mahmoud this is for taer this is for fatma who was only seven and some man shot dead at school at the age of 11. What would you do if you were under occupation? Let them take your freedom or fight for liberation. Lonely the freedom fighters of the Intifada fighting for freedom today cause there might not be a tomorrow now. Lonely the freedom fighters of the Intifada fighting for freedom today cause there might not be a tomorrow. Give me liberty or death. I'd rather go out on my feet than on my knees when I take my last breath. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Fighting Zionist oppression doesn't make you anti-Semitic. Yeah. They said the people won't ever live as one. They said this fight won't ever be done. They said the rights can't ever be won. They said that war can't be undone. They said the people couldn't make it this far. I say they don't know who we are. They say a lot of things. But they only say that mess because they fear the change of organized power brings We gotta keep it together so we can resist the pressure forever Organizing to counter oppressors who endeavor to sever the main vein That helps us maintain and stay sane in a fight to make change Don't let your tax dollars go to making people holler Killing off our future scholars with Apache helicopters Divest from this racist regime Till it redeems the dreams of those that killed midstream Divest 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 From Israel Divest 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 and let's lay apartheid to rest, yo. Long live the freedom fighters of the Intifada fighting for freedom today because there might not be a tomorrow. Peace, yo. Give it up for the organizers of the conference. The other speakers, the other performers. If one thing is true that I've learned over these years of activism is that we can't do it alone. And the better that we get to know each other, the stronger our relationships and the movement will be. It can't just be a political thing. It just can't be that way. We actually have to know each other. We actually have to care about each other, right? If we don't do that, then we're just gonna fall apart when it gets tough. And it's already tough. All right, lots of love, y'all. Peace. Well, what a powerful way to end our first evening of the conference. Mm -hmm.